today we have uh, David Brooks, a uh, columnist from the New York Times, uh, joining me for the Legatum uh, podcast. David, welcome. Uh, the last time you were here, we were talking about your Road to Character book. And in fact, you launched our Road to Character series. And uh, since then, we've had people like Lord Dubbs come and talk about compassion, mm -hmm. and Helena Morrissey come and talk about collaboration. And, uh, but actually, you've moved on a little bit in your <laughs> thinking since then. So I'd love yeah. to hear about how your thinking's moved from the Road to Character mm. book to your second mountain Yeah, book. well, first, it's a pleasure to be back at my wow. UK, my London home. At yeah, definitely your London home. I feel very at home here. <laughs> We were just upstairs in the library, and yeah. your library is my library. We own all the same books, so oh. intellectual kinship. Um, yeah, it has changed. I think when I wrote Road to Character, I was trapped still in an individualistic mindset. That character is something you do through um, internal struggle. You find out what your sins are, and then you develop your willpower. And it's like going to the gym. I'm going to build up my honesty muscles. I'm going to build up my whatever courage muscles. But I no longer really think that. I think I was just trapped in an individualistic mindset. I think there's some of that. But really what matters in life is not so much what we want to do, but what we really desire to do. Yeah. So knowledge is plentiful, but motivation is scarce. And so I, I've come to think that, that character building is not something we do alone. It's and what, what, was the, what were the kind of events that kind of led you to that sort of conclusion? Yeah. Actually, after my book came out, um, I noticed that in that book, i have written about a whole series of people from Samuel Johnson to um, Dwight Eisenhower to St. Augustine. And I realized afterwards, they all had amazing moms. <laughs> Their dads were very average, but um, they had amazing moms who really poured a lot of love into them. And so they understood what it was like to give and receive love. But they also knew when you fall in love with something, you make promises to it. Yeah. And so in my view, like say, when my first kid was born, I became aware of a level of love and commitment that I had never even imagined beforehand. And when you feel that love and feel that commitment, then you want to live up to the promises you make. And you may want to go you know, play tennis, but you have to take care of your kid. And so you begin to act a little less selfishly. Yeah. And so to me, when that, you do that over time, it ingrains certain habits and leads to better character. So to me, character is formed within our commitments and in our efforts to live up to the commitments that we cherish. And this is a book, just as you've said, really, that is very much about moving from the self to yeah. to having an other focus. Yeah. What does that journey look like? Yeah. Well, it, it, for me, it happened on two levels. For one was a personal mm. journey, and one was this uh, a social or national journey, or maybe global journey. The personal one was that uh, right around the time the road character was being finished, uh, I, I stumbled into a bad valley in life, and we all have valleys. And you know, I, my mom died about a, a year and a half ago, and that was a valley too, but it wasn't really my fault or anything. It was just, death is, is going to happen. Um, but then 2013 Valley was more my fault or my fault and the culture's fault. Mm -hmm. And that I had come to become disconnected with others in real way. And part of the problem was I believed the lies that the meritocracy teaches us. Yeah. That career success uh, leads to fulfillment, that life is an individual journey, that I can make myself happy by, all by myself by losing weight or getting good at something or winning victories. And when you lead a very self-enclosed life, uh, suddenly you weaken the connections between people. And so my marriage had ended, my kids were going off to college. I was part of the conservative movement most of my life and conservatism in the US was really beginning to change then. And I got disassociated from a lot of my friends. And so I was in this period where I, was, I had weekday friends People could have lunch with and talk politics. But on the weekends, I really didn't have weekend friends to sort of do life with. And so I was very lonely, and it emerged as sort of a burning in the stomach. Uh, and I realized, you know, you realize you've misled your life. Yeah. Uh, and I grew up in a home that was not emotionally expressive at all. We were very stiff upper lip. Very um, British. We were very Anglophilic. <laughs> My two turtles were named Israeli and Gladstone <laughs> when I was eight. So we were very Anglophilic. My mother wrote her dissertation on the forming of Wimbledon Common. and my father on John Ruskin. Yeah. So even though we were, should have been New York Jews, we should have been loud and boisterous. We were very stiff upper lip um, and reticent. And so, uh, and as I was going through this crisis of disconnection, a lot of people in America and a lot of people here were going through it. Uh, rise of loneliness, rise of alienation, complete fall of social trust, 30% uh, rise in suicide, 70% rise of teenage suicide. And so it was the same thing. 
And if I can see that happening, and I know that my life is very self-orientated, how do I go about switching it to have yeah. a kind of other's focus? Yeah, so there you have to go through some stages. One, you, you throw yourself on your friends, yeah. and you have deeper conversations than you ever had with them, and it turns out to be very good for your friendships. I used to think, oh, they'll, they'll, they'll be so annoyed at me that I'm calling them at night. But no, they were very delighted, and now when people call me, I'm completely delighted, because you can work on your friendships. So you do that, but then you do have to go out into the wilderness. There has to be some inner work done in solitude. And you basically, if you're living a first mountain life, you've been living according to the desires of the ego. Am I known? Am I liked? Am I making an impact? And when you go alone out in the wilderness, there's no audience to tell you you're doing good or doing bad. Mm -hmm. And so you stop performing. Uh, the rocks and trees don't care. And so there was a period of inner work, which for me is done through reading spiritual books, because that's the kind of person I am. And so first, there's the, the throwing yourself on friends. Second, the inner solitary work. And the third, putting yourself in new circumstances that will force you to live in a different way. Yeah. We talk here about that life is uh, not about what you're getting, but what you're becoming. It sounds yeah. like there are echoes of that in your in yeah. the book as well. Right. And the good news, you know, all this happened to me in my early 50s. Yeah. And you're never too late to change a, a lot, which is good news to me. And then I fell into a community of young people in D.C. that um, where we have dinner together every Thursday night. And they're D.C. kids. Now they're about 21, 22. But they are completely emotionally transparent. And they force you to show all the way up. And they beam <laughs> love at you. And they demand that you beam love back <laughs> at them. And so they give you experience at being emotionally expressive. And so that. And is it in that community that you feel like you've been able to build character more? In a way, because you know you have to, you know, w one of the young ladies now lives with us who had some. They all have problems in their families, and maybe I'd like to go out and just hang around my wife on a set Friday night. But if our our friend and now our adopted niece is in trouble, she needs our she needs us. So you 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 do you know what you. You know what the right thing to do is. Yeah. And you make those internal decisions. Right. And you've put yourself in proximity to problems. That's yeah. a lot of things it's easy for a lot of us to do um, is to live in a world where there aren't a lot of social problems. Yeah. But if you, you know, a friend of mine uh, graduated from Harvard and he was going to go to McKinsey or do something like that. But he said, I, I really want to put myself out where the problems are. And he went to teach in New Orleans at bad schools and he was suddenly the problems were all in front of him. Yeah. And it changed the whole course directory of his life. And that's the nice thing about mentoring, by the way. You get sucked in. You, feel, you think, I'm only going to be with this kid one hour a week. I can handle that. But then once you start caring about the kid, suddenly it's a big life commitment. And in a very good way. And you start taking their calls. And right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and you talk in your book about the difference between joy and happiness as well. Can you, can you talk to me about that? Yes. So happiness is what we aim for on the first mountain. Mm. And it's when you win a promotion. Uh, your team wins the World Cup, uh, or your, um, something goes well in your life. You're mm. moving toward your goals. And happiness is experienced as a sort of self-expansion. And joy is experienced as self-transcendence. You forget where you end and somebody else begins. And that can happen with a mother and a child. Mm. It can happen out in nature when you just feel at one with the universe. It can happen at work when we have experience of the flow, where you're, you've just lost self-consciousness. Yeah. And they're fleeting, but they're moments of great joy. And, and then there are some people um, who are just emanate joy all the time, where joy is not a moment. They just radiate goodness all the time. And their life is just pure gift. Mm -hmm. um, I get to work these days with Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist. And that guy is just joyous all the time. He's just grateful to meet every human being he meets. We're sitting in a room with the Dalai Lama across the wall. He's the same, isn't and he? And he, is he just laughs and laughs and laughs. I, had a lunch with him and he didn't say anything very profound, which was unfortunate, but uh, he just radiated incandescent light. Yeah. Um, David, one of the things that you previously said is that our lives are defined by our moment of great adversity and how we react to it. As, I, as I've read that, I've thought about the generation that we're in now yeah. with rising mental health problems mm -hmm. and many of our young people who would say that there is great adversity but could actually this be turned around? Uh, yeah. Could it actually become a message of hope? And what does your book, do you think, have yeah. to say to young people in particular who are struggling with some of those issues? Right. So, of course, I run into people, young people suffering yeah. from depression, it seems on almost a daily, weekly basis. 
And I would say, I have a little section on what suffering does. And we shouldn't romanticize suffering. You, should, you just, sometimes it's just terrible. Yeah. Uh, but it does, uh, Paul Tillich, a 1950s theologian, said it, moments of suffering interrupt your life and they remind you you're not the person you thought you were. We all perform at a certain level through the daily life. But in suffering, he says, it carves through the bottom of your soul and it reveals a cavity below. And you, so you see deeper into yourself. Yeah. And so it, it tenderizes you. And sometimes you need to be tenderized in order to feel. And in moments of suffering, you're feeling bad things, but at least you're feeling something. Yeah. And from there, once you're opened up, um, then you can have, you open for much deeper relationships than you could have before. And so I argue that you, in moments of suffering, you can either be broken or broken open. So if you think about what's happening, for instance, in our university campuses, and actually people saying, I don't want to hear that, yeah. or I want to be shielded from yeah. that and protected from the exchange of, I of ideas, that actually isn't being tenderized right. by... So what do you think is happening there? Yeah, I, you know, I, I ran a conference last week in D.C., and we had 350 people there who were all doing community work, and some of them were young yeah. in their 20s, and... Uh, one woman stood up and just said, I don't feel safe. Uh, the conference, has, the schedule has been too full. I feel very un endangered. And the, frankly, the 57-year-old in me wants to say, grow up. I mean, it's, it's not that hard to sit through a conference. This is not World War II. Uh, but then, so that's the ugly side of me. Mm -hmm. The other side of me says, you know, that feeling of unsafety is not just because of this conference. It's because of living in a world that is where people feel invisible, a world that you walk into no inherited moral structure for yeah. who you should be. And so you're, you're walking into a world where you're naked and alone and it feels like a lot of systems ignore you uh, or just discard you. And that, that feeling of unsafety is a, is a spiritual feeling and it's an existential feeling. And so there has and to be- And it's very real for very many right, people. Right, right. Yeah. So you have to acknowledge that it's very real and so you know, if, if anybody's been in an argument with a spouse, saying "grow up" does not work. <laughs> no, 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 not not a good pathway to yeah. go on. And so you have to try to offer first that sense of um, that sense of safety. Uh, we had a, a researcher actually at this conference named Martha Welsh of Columbia, who says people sometimes think their emotions are all in their their brains, but if you actually look at the magnetic pulses, they're in our vagal nerves. They're down in our nervous system. And she says, you have to realize the brain stretches throughout the body. And if the, the nervous system does not feel safe, then the brain is not going to think clearly. No. And so you have to calm the nervous system. And in your book, you outline a theory of change for society. You've said, my basic theory of social change is that culture changes when a small group of people find a better way to live and the rest of us copy them. Yeah. Have you seen that sort of community anywhere? And how do you think um, we can reproduce that? Yeah, well, I, I think it's happened through history that hippies were a new way to live and people copied them. I think Britain turned itself around really 1830s to 1848. There were new groups rose from the bottom and some from the top. Um, and today, everywhere I go, I meet, um, what do we call them, weavers, just people who, who, are, people who are really good at relationship. And some of it is informal. They just, they're the person on the block who invites everybody else over. They're the one arranging any common activity, the croquet tournament or whatever. But off, often they're professional. I've spent the last two years traveling around the US finding weavers who run organizations. And they're amazing people. Um, often some very terrible thing happened to them. Uh, it was with a woman named Lisa Fitzpatrick from New Orleans who was a healthcare executive. And she was driving, or she was in the passenger seat many years ago, and she saw two little boys, 10 and 11, with something in their hands. They looked terrified, and so she was riven by their faces. And what they were holding was a gun, and they held it up and they shot her in the face. And it was a yeah. gang ritual. They just, put, wow. to get into the gang, they had to shoot some yeah. random person. Um, and she recovered, and she remembered, I wasn't really the victim here, I was just collateral damage. Yeah. The two boys were the victims that they have to do this to feel they have membership in something. So she quit her job and, and works with uh, um, gang members. Yeah. And uh, then she transitioned. She moved into a very poor neighborhood, one of the poorest in America, as she puts it, with two very beautiful daughters. And so as a result, all the guys in the neighborhood started hanging around her house. <laughs> and then when the girls realized where the guys were, they started hanging around. 
And so she would sit around on weekends with 40, 50, 60 kids just hanging around the house and she would feed them and help them. And she said a lot of these kids, even though they were 16, 17, they'd never had toys growing up. So she would give them Legos and they were transfixed by Legos because they, they didn't get to have that. Um, and she finally said to a group of 35 of them, why are you hanging around an old lady like me on a Saturday afternoon? And they just said, you're the only one who ever opened the door. And so they, yeah. these people, they practice just radical hospitality. Yeah. So we here are wanting to build a transformational movement of people. Yeah. And what advice would you give to us at the Logatum Institute yeah. for building deeply committed relationships yeah. through which we could see the sort of transformation of society we long to see? Yeah. Well, this is the challenge I'm now facing with my, pro my WEAVE project. Um, and my theory was that social change happens, as I said, when a small group of people find a better way to live and the rest of us copy. But one has to hold up the better way. Yeah. And, you know, there are a lot of examples of this. I mean, frankly, the early church is a very good example of yeah. 12 men going out and yeah. changing culture. It's always been thus, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so I think there's some roles there. First, there are the people who are doing the change. Mm. Then for me, and I, maybe for you, there are illuminators mm. who just shine a light on the change. Yeah. And so I think that's something that has to be done. There's a, a guy named Stuart Brand in, the, in California who in the 50s, he decided, you know who's cool? Indians are cool, cool. Native Americans. We should all live on the land. He wrote something called the Whole Earth, Whole Earth Catalog and which sold three and a half million copies, won the National Book Award and became the source of the commune, hippie commune movement. And he really formed the hippie movement. And then when the commune movement fell apart because farming is difficult, um, he was in Menlo Park and he came across this thing called the Homebrew Computing Club, which was the origin point of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, communes aren't cool, computers are cool. And he wrote a piece for, the, for uh, Rolling Stone called The Rise of the Hacker Culture. And so in two separate instances, he named a movement into yeah. existence. He yeah. found cool people, said those people are cool, you yeah. should be like them. Yeah. Then I, I think the third thing that a movement needs is it needs an infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so movements have, have um, a series of gathering conferences, movements have training. So people, a lot of people in the community movement, they did it because they were shot in the face. They had yeah. no training. And they have to deal with trauma, a lot of things. So, and then a movement needs uh, ways they can support each other, hubs with networks around them. Because a lot of the people who are building community feel very lonely, actually. Mm -hmm. They're running organizations. Um, and so you think of all the things a, a network needs, there are a lot of, a lot of institutions and roles that somebody has to fill to join all these local efforts. Yeah. David Brooks, we are delighted that you've been here to talk about The Second Mountain. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, and I just wish you all the best with your book tour in the UK. Okay, Thank pleasure. You. Thank you.